Uh, this is going to be a real quick coffee break. Just talking about uh, predicting causal variance with FG was, And then we'll talk a little bit about variant annotation at the end. So I'm Ben Busby. I'm the scientific director of the research platforms community. And this is my kitchen. Uh, I roast coffee and drink it. All right, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about DNA nexus. Uh, so often we have uh, complex phenotypes of unknown etiologies. So uh, for example, in the UK biobank data set, uh, we have uh, many, many folks uh, with say something like pancreatic cancer. Um, and then we don't understand uh, necessarily the etiology of pancreatic cancer. Some of that's going to be uh, genetically predisposed. Uh, other things are going to be environmentally predisposed. Other things will be a combination of those two things. Um, and really, I think uh, our platform allows uh, folks to uh, do that type of analysis. That said, if you're not a DNA Nexus uh, customer, uh, obviously you can do um, all of these things on the command line uh, and roll your own uh, with a great deal more work. Uh, so I'll I'll talk about sort of the general concepts and then a little bit about how DNA Nexus makes all this easier. So uh, one thing that I've talked about a lot is uh, we're able to do cohort selection in a GUI or graphical user interface way. And here uh, I can select cohorts, say females over the age of uh, 60 that have uh, various neoplasms, perhaps pancreatic cancer, and then uh, compare that to a similar cohort uh, without pancreatic cancer. Uh, and that's uh, something that I particular I find particularly useful when I do these types of analysis. Uh, so thinking about GWAS, um, oh right, and so when I do those cohorts, then I can do a GWAS and look at variants uh, that are more uh, prevalent in um, a cohort with a phenotype that I'm interested in. Uh, that does not mean uh, if I find a hit on G in GWAS, that does not mean that is a causative or driver variant. Now, um, EBI has a GWAS catalog that uh, they work on in conjunction with NHGRI and to some extent NCBI. Um, and uh, there's about 5,000 studies in there. Uh, but uh, really, subphenotyping clinically is difficult. And, and one of the things that makes it so difficult is uh, the number of systems that we have uh, to describe clinical phenotypes. Um, and also, uh, well matched disease samples are very difficult. Obviously, uh, there are always covariates we don't know about. And so some of those covariates may come into play when we start thinking about different populations. Uh, so additionally, when we do GWAS on whole genome sequencing, which people typically do, uh, up to 95% of the loci are in non-coding regions. And uh, fine mapping really helps out with that type of thing. And here, uh, thinking about epigenetic loci uh, I think is is particularly helpful. And I'll show a really specific example of that in just a minute here. Actually, right now. So here what I've done is taken DNA, DNA susceptibility sites uh, in identified in the body of the pancreas and uh, used it to really try to think about which mutations uh, could be driver mutations um, in... Uh, this GWAS mapping. When I say I, what I really mean is Peter Nguyen. Uh, he's also written a blog post on this, uh, and I'll have the link for you uh, in the next slide. That said, uh, here what you can see is that we've taken hundreds of potential GWAS results uh, and really knocked them down to a couple of lo loci, uh, which is fine math. So that's something uh, that is extremely useful uh, and really sort of the reason that we're interested in fine math. Uh, so here you can see uh, a pipeline uh, where basically he uses ENCODE uh, to look at DNA seq. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did a webinar on uh, epigenetics, and we talked about a great number of databases, including EpiMap, uh, where you can now get even more data uh, for this type of thing. Um, and then here uh, you can see that you can knock things down uh, to credible sets. Um, and then really uh, try to predict driver mutations, which is really useful. But better yet, uh, if you are a DNA Nexus user, uh, here you can find a public project in DNA Nexus uh, where you can get uh, both applets as well as notebooks uh, that were used to analyze 
uh, this particular data. And I think that's, uh, that's a really very nice thing. So that said, I'd like to switch gears a little bit. Uh, so, you know, doing fine mapping is amazing, but then whenever we have a set of variants, uh, I think it's very useful to annotate it. And, and really sort of variant annotation can be used sort of as a proxy for fine mapping, but it can also be used to confirm results uh, from uh, GWAS fine mapping. Um, and so obviously uh, many, many people use SNPF here at the bottom. We can see some very, very basic uh, annotation done by SNPF. And, and SNPF, I think, is, is still used as sort of a, a bedrock benchmarking tool. But at the same time, I, I think now we can go beyond SNPF uh, with really more sophisticated annotation systems. And I'll show you a couple uh, that you could bring in uh, and use uh, with DNA Nexus if that's something you wanted to do. Um, or you can use them out there on your own. Uh, so one example is Varsum. Varsum is a very popular uh, annotation framework uh, that people are interested in. And uh, there is a, a really helpful website uh, that you can use to go uh, and just look at individual variants uh, very easily. A similar product is Open Cravat. So Open Cravat, you can think of it as uh, SNPF sort of on steroids. So here uh, you have about 150 annotators that are modular and that you can choose from. So if you're interested in Somatic mutations, there's a bunch of annotators that are relevant to cancer. Uh, if you're interested in germline, there's a bunch of uh, germline annotators. Um, and you can see names of familiar annotators uh, here in the lower right. So uh, Open Cravat is uh, particularly easy to use and uh, completely free uh, for non-for-profit research. Uh, here, uh, you can implement uh, Open Cravat in uh, Jupyter Notebooks, it's really quite easy to do. Uh, and here I've just selected uh, a bunch of modules that are relevant to uh, germline SNP annotation. And so, um, and, and of course these are examples and a complete list is uh, available at opencravat.org. Um, and, and Open Cravat does both sort of structural models uh, as well as um, predictive models, things like uh, Rebel, uh, as well as clinical models, things like uh, ClinMark. Um, that said, uh, going to another level, uh, there's Helix Labs uh, that has the uh, BioPredict 3DM alignment. Uh, this is sort of a, a, a very sort of Cadillac suite of variant annotation, but certainly something uh, that might be worth taking a look at, particularly if you work uh, for a relatively large organization uh, who may be able to get access to these tools. And uh, this is something that could be uh, implemented on the DNA Nexus platform. So uh, just things to think about in terms of variant annotation. Again, SNPF, Anavar, uh, I think of them as sort of, a, a sort of basic tools, but now uh, we can go farther uh, with tools like Varsum and Open Cravat uh, and uh, Helix. So, um, and again, they can really be used to confirm um, findings in GWAS. Um, there's one final thing I wanna talk about, uh, really just to pique the brain of the, the bioinformaticians in the audience. Um, and that's thinking about HOMS and HETS. So um, one uh, particularly tricky thing is that if you have a, a deletion in uh, one copy of a gene, and then you see um, a, uh, a SNP in the other copy, is that a homozygote or a heterozygote? And uh, really, uh, PIVCF would call that a homozygote. Other folks would call that a heterozygote. It really depends on the function uh, of that particular SNP. Um, and uh, just to illustrate this is a real thing. Uh, so in type two diabetes, uh, TCF7L2 uh, really has a very, very sharp peak um, in uh, type 2 diabetes GWAS, uh, which is very interesting and, you know, obviously something that a lot of folks are following up on. But if we look at ClinVar, uh, what we see is there's actually also a number of deletions um, that are cited as pathogenic that cross uh, that uh, locus. So if you had that particular SNP from the GWAS in TCF7L2, uh, as well as a deletion, then um, is that homozygous or heterozygous? And, and I think that's uh, honestly an unanswered question. Um, luckily, uh, 
our documentation, DNA Nexus documentation, is very clear about the way we handle uh, homozygotes and heterozygotes, particularly uh, in the Apollo framework. But uh, really, always check the documentation uh, of whatever uh, annotator you're using uh, to make sure it's consistent with your understanding. With that, I'd like to thank a bunch of people, particularly Peter Nguyen, uh, who did uh, really a bunch of the seminal work here, uh, Open Cravat and Helix uh, for providing slide material, um, and a bunch of other people for helping put on this webinar. So thank you very much, and have a great rest of the day.